Jesus Christ is God. I'm going to be teaching you about the deity of Jesus Christ this morning. This is a very important doctrine. Some people, you know, they'll wonder, is Jesus Christ God or is he the Son of God? And the truth of the matter is he's both. But today I'm going to be talking on one aspect of that is that Jesus Christ is God. He's not only the Son of God. Some people ask, well, who's Jesus Christ? Well, he's the Son of God, but he's not God. No, he's both. And you have to believe this. It's an important doctrine. Uh, why is it important? Well, we saw there in John 8. We'll just go there. In verse 23, it says, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So who, it is, who do you have to believe he is? Otherwise you'll die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake of them, to them of the Father. So you see how you need to believe that Jesus Christ is God. We use the word Father is generally used to refer to God. It's also one, you know, one of the identities within the Trinity as well. So why is this doctrine important that we believe that Jesus Christ is indeed that God manifest in the flesh because he said, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You know there are cults out there and some, well, I guess any denomination of Christianity that rejects the deity of Jesus Christ is not Christianity, right? Because Christianity believes the deity of Jesus Christ. So you have like the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I, think that, I think the Christadelphians as well, I think they reject the deity of Jesus Christ as well. And, and obviously you have other religions too, like Islam. If somebody does not accept that Jesus Christ is God, they are not saved, right? If they believed on Jesus Christ, but that Jesus Christ that they believed on is not God, they are not believing on the true Jesus Christ, right? So it matters what Jesus Christ you believe in, you know, because the, the Bible talks about somebody coming and preaching another Jesus, right? So we, sometimes when we used to go soul winning in, in Mexico, there's tons of people named Jesus, right? And we tell people, hey, you just go and believe on Jesus down the street. Is that going to save you? No. Just because their name's Jesus doesn't mean that's the Jesus that can save you. And that's why, you know, even when it comes to the Muslims too, you know, they say they believe in a Jesus, but it's a different Jesus, right? It's a Jesus that's just a prophet. It's a Jesus that's not God. It's a Jesus that didn't die on the cross. And likewise, even if you have so-called Christian religions that say they believe in Jesus, if it's not God who they're talking about, that, who that Jesus is, then they have the wrong Jesus. So it's very important. This, is the, the, the one of, this doctrine is one of the doctrines where, you know, if it's not believed or it's taught wrongly, then it's heretical, right? When we talk about heresy, generally we talk about things that will affect a person's salvation. There are doctrines that you can learn in, the Christian, in Christianity that don't necessarily affect salvation, right? Like, for example, we talked about end times events not too long ago. Different people have different views on how end times events play out, but how you view those end times, what you believe about that, is not necessarily going to change whether you're saved or not. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Jesus Christ you're believing in is not God, then you haven't actually gotten saved yet. Right? You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to go through in this sermon, I'm going to just go through a lot of the verses that show the deity of Jesus Christ. So you can see how strong this doctrine is throughout the Bible and um, you know, it's very, very clearly taught throughout the Bible. So we'll go through it. First one, first sort of group of verses we're going to look at is just the plain statements in the Bible that state that Jesus Christ is God in one way or another, right? So we're going to start here at 1 Timothy 3 because this is probably one of the clearer ones, but... There's a, lot of, there's a lot of clear ones in the Bible, and even as we go through it, you'll see um, you know, there's really no other way to explain it. If somebody doesn't believe Jesus is God, there's really no other way to explain you know, why Jesus says the things he says, can do the things he does, and the Bible says these things about him. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery 
of godliness. What is the mystery of godliness? Well, he's going to tell us. So it's not that we don't know what this mystery of godliness is. He's just saying it's very great. It's a, it's a large mystery, but now it's been made known. What is it? That God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. That's why when people ask, was well, Jesus God or is he the Son of God? Well, he's both. Because God was manifest in the flesh. That one who was manifest in the flesh is the Son of God. But he's God because that's who was manifest in the flesh. right? So God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit. Seen of angels. So how do we know this is talking about Jesus? Because Jesus did all these things. Seen of angels. You remember when the angels worshipped him? Preached unto the Gentiles. Who's preached unto the Gentiles? That's Jesus Christ, right? Believed on in the world. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Received up into glory. So who was that man that did all these things? It was God. God was manifest in the flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, a very clear one as well. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? The Word was God. So not only was the Word with God, but the Word was God. And you say, well, who is this Word? Well, in verse 14, when we go a bit further down into the chapter, look at what it says. It says, and the Word was made flesh. Right? God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And obviously, if you know the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is about Jesus Christ. Right, so the Bible's saying here that Jesus Christ was the Word which was with God, which was God, was made flesh. I'll show you a couple of others that you may not be so familiar with. This one, I think, is pretty cool. 1 Corinthians 15. If you know about 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's the resurrection chapter in the Bible. You know, it starts off with the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And the reason why Paul is talking about the gospel and he's talking about the death and the resurrection because those in the Corinthian church, some of them were rejecting that truth. And that's also another heresy, right? Because he says, if you don't believe Christ is risen from the dead, your faith is vain. You're, you're yet in your sins. So like like we're talking about today, the deity of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Christ is another one. People that don't believe Jesus Christ died and rose again is a heresy as well. So because it's the resurrection chapter, it also talks about our resurrection. You know, it's the same chapter that talks about us being changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, right? So this is talking about our resurrection too. And then as we get here to verse 44, it's, it's talking about the difference between Adam and and Jesus Christ, right? So it is sown a natural body, right? So it's talking about us, we're going to be sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body, right? So you see there that resurrection theme going through this chapter. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So that's referring to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the last Adam. So just like we are sown in the image of Adam, like this natural body, we're going to be raised in the image of Jesus Christ when we're resurrected. How be it, verse 46, that was not first, which is spiritual. So he's saying the spiritual body didn't come first. Adam came first, right, physically, and then Jesus came later, 2,000 years ago. But that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Look at this. The first man is of the earth, earthy. Look who the second man is. The second man is the Lord from heaven. <laughs> right? So you see how that, that, suit, that matches, that God was manifest in the flesh. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a good teacher. He's indeed the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, what's that? It's Adam, right? Because we're sons of Adam. Adam was created in God's image. We are sons of Adam, right, physically. But one day we're going to be adopted, put on a new body that is in the image of God, right? We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Colossians 2, look at this one. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's also a great verse as well to remind us, you know, we need to follow the Bible. Make sure that we don't get ruined in our faith, right? Spoiled through man's philosophy and deceit and traditions of men and end up believing something that's contrary to the Bible. 
after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Look at this. For in Him, who in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right? So you see how it's very consistent. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in bodily form. Right? Because He put on flesh. Right? Jesus Christ is God. Hebrews 1. Now, before I read this, I just want to show you Psalm 45. So this is a psalm that's quoted in Hebrews 1. And you can see here it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a, is a right scepter. Now look here when it's quoted in Hebrews 1. You know, Paul writes here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Who was this psalm actually spoken to? Well, this is what he says here in Hebrews 1.8. But unto the Son, he saith. Right? That man, Jesus Christ. Unto the Son, he saith. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. You see there? So the, that psalm, thy throne of God, was directed at Jesus Christ, showing that Jesus Christ is indeed God. So there are some sort of clear statements in the Bible talking about the deity of Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the names that are ascribed to Jesus Christ. The names given to Jesus Christ. Look at it in Isaiah 9.6. This is often one that's read during Christmas time when we talk about the birth of Jesus. It says here, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now everyone knows Jesus as the Prince of Peace. They all know him as wonderful and counselor. But those that reject his deity, they, they tend to stop here. You know? It's like, well, he's not this one, <laughs> this one, right? But he's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. See, there's an allusion to that Trinity, that Godhead. Remember, I taught about it a couple of weeks ago. That he's not only just one of three gods, right? He is the God as well. That's why he's also known as God the Father, right? As the everlasting Father. Now, I've heard people to try and get around this verse, they'll say, like, well, it's not that he is the mighty God, it's just that he's called the mighty God. You know, some people even say that, they'll say, like, well, it's, it's not even that he's called, it's just that his name shall be called. So it's like his name has a name. <laughs> some people say that. But, you know, Jesus' names are very significant, right? How do we know this? Because look at Matthew 1 when he's named Jesus. Right? You'll see the same phrase of his name shall be called. Right? Matthew 1, this is the famous Christmas, one of the famous Christmas passages. Uh, Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in dreams, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name. So you see how it's just that, that's just how the Bible just says that that's somebody's name, right? Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why was he called Jesus? For he shall save his people from their sins. Isn't that a significant name to give him? Right? Because that's what that means. That's why Jesus' names are significant. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Look at this. Which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. See, Jesus Christ is God and it's even in his name, in his very name as well. Not only does Jesus mean he'll save his people from their sins, Emmanuel, God with us. But we also have Isaiah 9, 6. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All right, so his name. Let's go into the third section. Third section. The third section is sayings. Things that Jesus said about himself that make you think, well, how can he say these things if he's not God? Well, obviously, when he said them, People thought that that's what he was claiming, right? Let's go to John 10. John 10, this is a, a really awesome passage about eternal security, right? We use this when we talk about 
being saved and not being able to lose eternal life because once you're in the Father's hand, you're in Jesus' hand, you cannot be let go. Uh, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So you see that hand that Jesus talks about, his hand and his father, Father's hand, is the same hand. Right? But some people will say, well, I and my Father are one. They say that doesn't mean that they're actually one and the same, you know, in the sense, in the real sense, of that they are one, like God was manifest in the flesh. They'll say, oh, but then, no, they, when they say that they're one, it just means that they're just one in purpose. Right? They just have the same goal. They're just trying to do the same thing. So we're in two hands. They just do the same thing. Well, let's read on, because when we read on, that's not what the Jews thought, right, when he said that to them. Look in verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man, look at this, makest thyself God. So you see, they understood what he meant by I and my Father are one when he was talking to them. They understood that he was claiming to be God manifest in the flesh. John 14, 6. John 14, 6 is Jesus talking to his disciples. <clears throat> Philip, particularly. But John 14, 6 is a, is, a, is a famous passage as well. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's a good test as well to see whether somebody has the right Jesus. Because some people will say they believe in Jesus and they accept Jesus, but he's just like one way to heaven. And, you know, if you're a Buddhist, you'll go to heaven that way. You're a Muslim, go to heaven that way. That's Jesus, just how Christians go to heaven. No. Jesus said, the real Jesus said, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through him. Verse 7, If he had known me, you should have known my father also and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him right so jesus says hey you've seen the father philip saith unto him lord show us the father and it sufficeth us what does that mean it means that's enough for us if you just show us the father then then it's done right we know now jesus saith unto him have i been so long time with you and yet has thou not known me philip he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So notice what Jesus is saying there. Philip's saying, show us the Father, I want to see the Father. And Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? So he's claiming there to be the Father. He says, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now I've heard some people try and raise objections to this passage and say like, well, you know, the Father's in Him, it's kind of like the Holy Spirit's in us. That doesn't mean they're one and the same. Yeah, but I can't say to you that if you've seen me, you've seen the Holy Spirit. <laughs> can you? You know, I can't say that, I can say the Holy Spirit's in me, but can I say I'm in the Holy Spirit? Right, so Jesus is obviously a different level of integration <laughs> with the Father than we are with the Holy Spirit. Luke 18. Let's look at some other things that Jesus said. Verse 18, Luke 18, 18. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So we're not going to read the whole passage here, but we see this rich young ruler come to him to ask, Hey, what, is, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life? But what we want to point out here and what Jesus refers to, Jesus points out when he says, talks to him, he calls him good master. Look at what, how Jesus replies to him. Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. So you know what he's saying to the rich young ruler there? If you're acknowledging me as good, you're acknowledging me as God, because there is only one good, that's God. Right? Because Romans 3, there is none good, no, not one. Because if he was just a man, he would be a sinner, just like all of us. But he's not. He's God manifest in the flesh. And that's why he says, hey, if you're acknowledging me as good, then he must be God. Otherwise, he's a sinner. Right? So you can't believe Jesus is sinless and not believe he's God, right? Because the only one that can be sinless is God. We are only sinless 
because of his righteousness, right? We're sinless in the eyes of God, not because we are indeed sinless of our own, um, our own merit. What about this one? None of you ever noticed this in the, in the temptation in the wilderness with Jesus. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stones. So what is he telling Jesus to do? He brings him up to a high place and says, you Basically, you're trying to commit suicide. Jump off. The angels are not going to let you, right, because of what the Bible says. Now, Jesus doesn't succumb to this temptation of the Satan trying to prove to him that he's the Son of God. But look at what Jesus says to him. Look at the verse that he uses to rebuke Satan for tempting him. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Who is he tempting? He's tempting Jesus Christ. But notice how when he responds to Satan, he says, Hey, don't tempt the Lord thy God. All right, so it's interesting that some of the things that Jesus says. Let's look at number four. Number four. We're going to look at attributes of Jesus Christ. Attributes of Jesus Christ that show us that he cannot be just a man or just some created being. Like some people believe he's maybe the first created being, he's just exalted. But we'll look at some attributes that show that he can't just be this exalted being. That he's God in the flesh. Now, this verse in Micah 5 is a, is a well-known passage. Why? Because Micah 5.2 is the Old Testament passage that the wise men knew to know that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. Do you remember when the wise men came and they were looking for Jesus to worship him? And then the, 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 and King Herod asked them, where, you know, where is he going to be born? And then they look you know, and they know he's going to be born in, in Bethlehem, Ephrata. And in, in the Gospel of Luke, this, uh, this um, verse is actually quoted, right? This is how they know he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Why does it say this? It says, uh, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Look at this whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So you see how this one that's to be ruler in Israel, that's born in Bethlehem of Ephrata, but his goings forth have been from old, not just from the beginning, but from everlasting. He's eternal. See, so how can this person be eternal if he's not God? Well, like I said, he's God manifest in the flesh. So did the man have a beginning? Yes, when he was born in Bethlehem's manger, right? But the God that was manifest in the flesh has no beginning, and that's who that man is, right? God manifest in the flesh. Hebrews 7, when we talk about Melchizedek, Melchizedek is a picture, or it is Jesus Christ too. It's a pre-incarnate um, appearance of Jesus Christ. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 7 about Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So you see how this priest... Melchizedek was eternal, right? He didn't have a father or mother, no descent, no beginning of days, nor end of life. Now, understanding that Jesus Christ is eternal, now you know when he says to the Jews in John 8 how he could be, he could pre exist his birth, right? Look what he says to the Jews in John 8, verse 56 Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So notice that he's saying Abraham knew Jesus Christ, right? Because he knew God. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham, right? Because how old was Jesus? He was in his thirties, right? Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. 
Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, why is this phrase significant? And why the Jews knew what he was talking about when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, because when God appeared to Moses in the wilderness and sent Moses to go speak to Pharaoh, right, and sent him, look at how God introduces himself to Moses. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So you see how that phrase, when Jesus claims, I am, was very significant to the Jews because they knew that when God appeared to Moses in the wilderness, he told them, he told him to go and tell the children of Israel that I am hath sent me unto you. What right, a significant phrase there. Let's see what other attributes he has that are interesting. And we can see here his, uh, his pre-existence, right? Notice here in Matthew 22, verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So you can see here that, you know, God is talking to Jesus here, right? Who's God in the flesh. But what he's saying is David, when he wrote this psalm, or when he spoke this psalm, he talks about the Christ as his Lord. And Jesus is asking them the question, well, isn't the Christ the son of David? But then he's saying, if, the, if Christ is the son of David, how is he also his Lord? Right? He says here, if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? Right? Because some people try and put Jesus into a box, right? He's either one or the other. Well, he's both. Right? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So you say, well, which one is Jesus? Is he the son of David? Or is he, a Lord? Is he the Lord of David? Well, he's both. Right? Revelation 22, verse 16. Look, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. So notice, the Lord of David and the son of David. Right? The root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. What about when it talks about, like when we talk about Jesus Christ, we talked about his eternal, his everlasting. So you can see here that he pre-exists even David, pre-existed Moses, Abraham even. Abraham, Abraham was, I am. Let's talk about Jesus Christ and his om omnipresence, the fact that he's everywhere. I mean, if he's just a man, he can't be everywhere, right? But the Bible talks about him being everywhere. Look at this in Colossians 1 verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, what is it? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How, does, how is Jesus Christ in us unless he's, unless he's God? Right? Look what Jesus says here. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now there are probably you know, hundreds, thousands of people gathering all over the world in two or three or more in the name of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ saying, I'm there in the midst of every one of them. Right? So he's here with us today. You know, we were just at the uh, Anglicare shop yesterday and Elizabeth was thinking of buying this sign, you know that sign that says, you know, Jesus is the silent member in every house, the, uh, the silent listener at every conversation, and the most silent thing at every meal, the observer at every meal. And that, that's, a, that's a good thing to remember. That's a bit of a double-edged sword, that one, you know. It's comforting to know that Jesus Christ is with you, but it also reminds you to be accountable, right? He, he knows what you're doing, even when you're in your closet. Right? So he's everywhere. Look at what he says here to Nicodemus in John 3. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. It's him even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. <laughs> so he's talking to Nicodemus, saying he's the Son of Man. No man has ascended up to heaven, but the, son of, the, the one that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, 
which is in heaven. So you see, he's, he's both there and with Nicodemus there. Let's look at here. Let's look at some other attributes that Jesus has or some other actions that he did that can only be ascribed to God. Mark 2 verse 5, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And they were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins? Look at this, but God only. So notice when Jesus said, Thy sins be forgiven thee, he knew what statement he was making to the Jews, that he was indeed God. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to arise, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Isn't that interesting that Jesus says, which one's easier, right? To him, they're just as easy to forgive sins or to, to heal the man completely and say, take up thy bed and walk. Verse 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed and went forth before them all insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Right? So you see how he says, thy sins be forgiven thee. They say, who can forgive sins but God only? And he says, you know what? I'm going to heal this person to show you that I do have the power to forgive sins. And then he heals him as well. And he says, well, which one's easier for me to do? You can do both. And then he does do both. Right? Last one for attributes here. John 14. Look at here. You say... Only God can answer prayer, right? If you ask something of God, he answers prayer. But look at this. Here, here is Jesus answering prayer. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, look at this, I will do it. So you think, like, don't you ask things in Jesus' name and God does it? No, no, you ask... It's because it's God manifest in the flesh. You ask Jesus in his name, it says, he will do it. <laughs> I will do it. It's very interesting. All right, let's go on to the second last section. So I've got two more. Disciples. I want to show you some of the things that the disciples said to Jesus and look at how he responds. Look at some of the things his disciples said. John 20, verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So you remember the first time Jesus uh, appeared to his disciples? Thomas wasn't there. And uh, he doubted when they told him that they had seen Jesus risen again. This is the second. Now, there's another time where Jesus appears to them. Now Thomas is here this time. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, right? To see the holes, the prints of the nails in his hand. And be not faithless, but believing. Look at how Thomas responds. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody wasn't God and somebody said to them, my Lord and my God, you should probably tell them that you're not God. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus says, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Right? So I remember, you know, because uh, the Muslims try and say things like, well, show me a quote in the Bible where Jesus says he's God and then I'll believe you. Right? And it's a bit of a straw man because one is, you know, he doesn't have to say that specifically for us to realize that he's God. And, and, the, and the inconsistency is, is that they'll say that if you show them something in the Bible, they'll believe it, yet they don't believe everything else that you show them in the Bible, right? So it's not that like, they're being consistent, but sometimes I'll say to them, well, how about I show you somebody that calls him God and Jesus says, because you've seen me, you've believed. So I like to show them this one and um, see what their reaction is. John 20. That's John 20. That's Thomas. Look at what about Stephen. This is the passage where Stephen is stoned. He's preaching to the Jews. And then uh, he's talking about Jesus Christ and how they rejected all the prophets. Now they're rejecting Jesus Christ. He gets stoned. But as he's dying, look at what the Bible says here. And as they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, 
and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So you see there how he's, he's actually praying to Jesus, receive my spirit, but the Bible says that he's calling upon God. Last one in this section, this is just a short section, I've got one more. Acts 20, verse 28. I don't know if you noticed this one. This one's very interesting as well. This is uh, Paul, when he gathers the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20, he's going to go back to Jerusalem. He, he knows he's going to die there. They're all saying goodbye. And he says this to them. He says, Acts, in Acts 20, verse 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So isn't that interesting that it's, he's referring to, I mean, you, you, know, you can either be referring to God or to the Holy Ghost, but when he refers to the Holy Ghost, he says that the Holy Ghost hath purchased the church with his own blood. Right? Why? Because God was manifest in the flesh, right? That's, that's who it is. And then you have the three are one, Father, Word, Holy Ghost, right? So that's the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ. Right? It's interesting there, isn't it? Paul says. The last thing I want to just show you here, I want to show you some similarities between God and Jesus. Well, you see, God does one thing, but then Jesus does it as well. So then how do you explain that? Right? Similarities between God and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, let's talk about creation. Genesis 1, we know in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Exodus 20, you know, some people believe in this uh, day-age theory or gap theory, trying to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, but we see Exodus 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we know God created all things. But then in Colossians 1, we're told that Jesus Christ created all things, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. But who were we told in Exodus created all things? The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Whereas Colossians 1 said Jesus Christ did that. Why? Because Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Titus 1, I'll show you here. So here's another similarity. So we've got one similarity is, hey, who created all things? You've got God and Jesus. Titus 1, 3. Who is the Savior? You say, well, Jesus Christ is the Savior. You're right. Titus 1, 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment, look at this, of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. You say, no, well, they're two, no, they're the one and the same as well. Isaiah 43, verse 10, look at this. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me, I even, I am the Lord. Look at this. And beside me there is no Saviour. You see, there's one Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And this is why when you read on in Titus, it says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of who? Of the great God and our Saviour. Jesus Christ. Right? So when Jesus Christ returns and we see the appearing of Jesus Christ, who is appearing? The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's number two, the Savior. What about who raised Jesus from the dead? Galatians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. God raised Jesus from the dead. 
But look at what Jesus says in John 2, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us? This is after he drove out all the ones out of the temple, right? Buying and selling in the temple. What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So notice there, who raised Jesus from the dead? Was it God? Well, Jesus said he raised himself from the dead. What about this one? John 14, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So who sent the Comforter here? Whom the Father will send in my name. Right? So God, the Father, sent the Comforter. But look at what Jesus Christ says in John 15, verse 26. But, in, but when the Comforter is, is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. <laughs> Last one I'll show you here, and then we'll end here. Revelation 1.10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst are the seven, seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So who was talking to John here? It was Jesus Christ, right? One like unto the Son of Man. And look how Jesus describes himself. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book. But look at what the Bible says in Isaiah 44 about God. It says, Then saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now, there can't be two firsts, right? So you see here that when Jesus claims to be the first and the last, he is claiming to be that God of Israel, the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now, there's probably more in the Bible that I haven't showed here. These are probably the, the best ones that I'm showing you here today that I believe are the best ones. But just to finish up, just a reminder where we started. Why is this important? It's important that you believe that Jesus Christ is God because that's who was manifest in the flesh. And like we read in John 8, verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You just have to be very careful with cults out there that may try and teach you that Jesus Christ is not God, he's just the Son of God, and they'll try and remove his deity from him. You just have to be careful of that because that is a heresy. So what is true? Is he the Son of God or is he God? Well, he's both. That's what is true, right? So you have to believe both in order to be saved. Just remember, one thing you can always remember is with David, right? Is he the son of David or is he a lord of David? Well, he's the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. It's very important that we believe that because if not, Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. All right, I hope that gave you, uh, you know, some more uh, doctrine there, some more teaching there and just give you more confidence. You know, you need to listen back to this sermon again when you talk to people that may not believe this you can show them some of these verses and have a good conversation. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. And we thank you, Lord, that you did indeed step into the creation and die for us. Because of that, Lord, we have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for providing salvation to us. And uh, thank you, Lord, that um, you know, it's not, you're not just a, a man. You know, you are in indeed 
the Lord from heaven. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.